So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Mark chapter 12. And, and while you're turning there, so we've been going through this series of the abundant life. And talking about, we began a journey talking about as Christians, when we think about this abundant life or, or being Christ followers, if you can be like me at times in life, you feel like, you know what, being a Christian is not all that it was cracked up to be. I'm still frustrated. I'm still bitter sometimes. Things still aren't going the way I want them to go. All these different things, and we begin to put on display as we're supposed to represent the gospel. We look no different than our lost brothers and sisters in Christ. We fall victim to the same struggles, the same worries and anxieties, the same unwillingness to love people that are hard to love, all these different things. But when we think about this idea of experiencing the abundant life that Christ promised us, we fall short so many times when it comes to enjoying the life that God has for us, the, the life that God has planned for us in Christ. And so we, we began this journey with a, a passage of scripture in John 10, 10, where Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And through that journey, we talked about how he comes to, to steal the moments from your life. Those moments of abundance where you can enjoy God's providence, you can enjoy what God is doing in your life, you can enjoy these moments, but yet they're being stolen from you because the enemy is distracting you and causing you to look to tomorrow instead of enjoying today. The enemy's distracting you and, and getting you to think, you know what, you don't really have enough today, so don't enjoy this moment because there's more to be had. And so the enemy continues to whisper lies into our ears and we allow him to steal away the moments in our life that rob us from enjoying the abundance that God's promised. Or he also comes to kill. He comes to kill your joy. Kills the joy and sucks the life out of life. He comes and he, and he tells you it's not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not gonna measure up. What you're trying to accomplish, you'll never get there. And all of a sudden, discouragement settles in or you begin to feel guilty in this weight, losing the fact and knowledge and understanding that your identity in Christ is that you've been brought to perfection because you've been clothed in Christ's righteousness. But yet you hold on to, to this idea that you are still tainted and broken and struggling, and yet you're not seeing the beautiful identity that you have in Christ. This should overwhelm you with an incredible joy for the good news of the gospel. And the enemy is killing that from your life. And then he's destroying many things about your life, but most importantly, destroying your confidence in God. Because we wanna to look to the circumstances of our life to dictate whether or not God is good. Because we look to life and say, well, this is hard. Or this is, this is not what I wanted it to be. Or, or these things just, they're not going the way that I planned, God. So obviously the, oh, the problem here is you, it's not me. And we begin to destroy the confidence that we had in the Lord and who he is because we're looking at the wrong metric system to understand and to see the goodness of God in our life. But yet all through all those things, what Jesus says, that's what the enemy came to do. And if we're honest with ourselves, he's doing a pretty good job. But Jesus says, look, I have come that they may have life, but not only just have life, not only just to breathe the air and to live, but to have life abundantly, enthusiastically, living with joy, enjoying the moments, enjoying the laughter of your children or your grandchildren, enjoying the hard and allowing God to work through the hard to teach you something special, learning to how to live in abundance in life, and through learning that process and teaching ourselves, we talked about this idea of how to worry less and to worship more. We talked about the birds and the sparrows that Jesus talks about, how they either work hard or do nothing, but either way, God's sovereignty is at hand and all is provided for as all has a need. And that we need to trust in the Lord, that we trust in him more. We worry less about circumstances in life, but we worship him. We find contentment in what he's provided for us and what he's given us. We trust him for tomorrow and we focus on today and we enjoy the moments. We talked about loving your neighbor last week and how it's, it's beyond just loving those who are easy to love. Loving the lovable, that's easy, but it's loving when it's hard. It's loving those who mistreat you. It's loving those who disagree with you, but it's loving like Christ loves. 
and modeling that love and how the abundant life flows out of worshiping more and loving more. But today we're gonna talk about this idea of going all in. As you clearly see, Tim and Danny going all in for what God's called them to do, leaving nothing behind, ready to go, ready to be on the mission field, ready to do what God's calling them to do, going all in for what God's challenged them with. But when we think about life, you think about the chaotic struggle that, that, that we work in. And, and I wanna give a picture of like juggling. I literally tried to juggle this week to give you a visual. My ego couldn't handle it. It just, it wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna make it. I even tried again this morning to build my confidence. And I was juggling in the office this morning and I was praying and I was hitting myself with the ball and doing all kinds of stuff. I was like, you know what? They're pretty creative. They can get through this, right? So we're gonna do it without, without the tossing of the balls around. But think about life and juggling. And you think about, so you've got three balls and you're juggling them in the air. But what happens is when you think about all the surrounding that's going on around you, the noises, if people come up and run by you and all these different things, they start distracting you and you start throwing the balls and you start getting, throwing them faster. And, and then all of a sudden, maybe you throw one off just a little bit and all of a sudden it gets you going another direction and you're continuing to, and all of a sudden juggling is no longer fun. It becomes chaotic, it becomes hectic and it becomes a mess. But what we naturally think that we're supposed to do is, okay, well, let's take away a ball. Or if not, let's take away two. Well, okay, if you take away one of the three balls, is it still considered juggling? I would argue no. Because if you had two, you just, eh, eh. dude, I could have done that today. And then you take away, you just go to one. That's just like playing catch. That's not juggling. But what's the best thing that you can do when it comes to juggling, when it comes to the distractions around you? The best things to do is not to take away a ball because that ceased to be juggling, but it is to stop, to recalibrate, remove distractions and go again. And you begin to think you have a stronger foundation. You have a better understanding of what's going around you. You take a slower tempo. You continue to juggle the balls. And maybe your balls are your relationship with God. It's your family and it's your career. Let's just keep those three. You know, but what happens is when we look at those three, all of a sudden we think that we've got to get rid of one. And the reality is, guys, you're not going to get rid of your family and you're not going to stop working. So what happens is God gets kicked out and you go from three to two. And when you think about life, but what God's calling us to, he's not calling us to get rid and cease to juggle in a sense. He's calling us to stop, to recalibrate, focus and go again. And that's what I want to challenge us to today when it comes to our life. When it comes to going all in in life, it is, it is not cutting everything out, but it is recalibrating, refocusing on Christ and allowing Christ to work through the circumstances of your life. Because if you are like me, your schedule is busy. One more thing could literally send you over the edge and into the funny farm. And so think about how busy life can be and how hectic life can be. And maybe you're one of those people where you're bouncing around, you're doing so many things and you're doing nothing well. You're working for so many different people doing so many different things and you feel like you are satisfying no one. And that's life. And all of a sudden we wanna think about, well, how can I even comprehend this idea of going all in for Christ when I can barely get through each and every day? And again, it's let's stop Let's recalibrate and then let's go. So when we think about this idea of going all in, that's what I want us to really be thinking about today. And this is not a new concept when it comes to scripture, when it comes to Jesus. Think about the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, so whether you, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, not some things, so whether you eat or drink or go to church, do those things for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or parent, do those three things all to the glory of God. Or whether you eat or drink or go to work, do those three things to the glory of God. All things in all areas of our life are to be done to the glory of God. Even the simplest things of eating and providing nourishment to our physical bodies, we do that to the glory of God but how we want to take that and we want to compartmentalize it. And what Paul says, he says, I give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or the church of God. 
Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Now, before you read this passage of scripture and think, so that means I'm supposed to be a people pleaser when it comes to life. Well, if you really think about what is people pleasing all about, it's really actually about you. It's not about the pleasure of others. People pleasing is really about your pursuit of acceptance. People pleasing is about you seeking after and getting recognition from others more than it is about the other person. But what Paul is saying, I am trying to people please for the purpose of people getting saved. So when we think about going all in for the abundant life, just like last week when it was to love your neighbor, it's not about you. Going all in is still not about you. Because guess what? Even the gospel is not about you. You just get to enjoy the fruit of it. The gospel is the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is who we exalt. And that is his name. And so we think about, so for Paul, he's saying, I'm doing all these things so that many can be saved. And if we weren't convinced of that, what does he say in the chapter before? For though I am free from all, I love that, right? When you think about, we are free from the law. We are free from all in Jesus Christ. When we put our faith and trust in Christ, we have been forgiven of all unrighteousness and Christ dwells within us through the power of his spirit. And when he dwells within us, guess what? That means we have fulfilled the law because Christ has fulfilled the law. And we are clothed in his righteousness, free from the law to live for Jesus Christ. But what does he say? What does he do with that freedom? He says, but I choose to make myself a servant to all. Why? That I might win more for them. And how did he go about doing this? He would say, he said, to the Jews, I became a Jew. To the outsider, I was an outsider. To the weak, I became weak. And I did all things for all people that by all means, some would be saved. And then he says in this last verse, in, in, in verse 23, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. So here you see Paul in everything that he does, he does it for the glory of God, for the purpose of people getting saved. And at any time, in any situation necessary, he would become and represent the gospel of Jesus Christ and relate to people where they are in the hopes that some would get saved. He was going all in, laying down his freedoms, laying down his life for the purpose of seeing people come to faith in Christ. And that is a man going all in for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are just like Paul in our call to be disciple makers, to go all in for Jesus Christ. This is not something for the pastors or for the elders or for the deacons or for the Sunday school teachers or all small group leaders and what have you. This is for every disciple of Christ to make disciples. And in order to accomplish this, we must go all in. We can't continue to juggle life, giving God parts and portions and pieces and expect to see radical results and to go all in for Christ. The greatest example that I could see in this passage outside of Paul was a poor widow. And that's where I wanna focus this morning when we think about this idea of going all in. Because this widow humbles me every time I read this passage of scripture as I pray it humbles you. But listen to this poor widow and listen to her story in Mark chapter 12. It begins, this is Jesus. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people in lar in, put in large sums and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and he said, truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And so we read and we hear from this, from this poor widow and Jesus talking and using as a teachable moment for this young, for this lady here going all in, I would say for Jesus Christ and for the gospel and for her faith. And so what can we take from this passage of scripture to really help us to comprehend how we can also go all in as well? How can we go all in for the gospel of Jesus Christ? And look, this is not a message all about money. This is about your time. It's about your talents. And yes, it's about your giving but it's about your life. 
It's about how are you investing in the kingdom of God? How are you going all in for Jesus Christ in all areas of your life? Are you letting him into all areas of your life? Are you trusting him with every part of your life? And are you willing to do what he calls you to do, what he makes clear to you in your life? So a couple of things that we can draw from this when we think about this idea of going all in. Number one, it demands greater reliance on God. Plain and simple. When you think about going all in for Christ, there is a reliance upon God that is absolutely radical when it comes to the way you currently live your life if you are not living it totally surrendered to God. And this is what Proverbs is talking about when we read Proverbs chapter three, probably a very well-known passage of scripture for all of us, but he says this, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. So we have to start there. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Not trusting in the Lord in part of your life. Not trusting in the Lord in part of, a part of your heart for a part of the things that you love. Allowing you to continue the, the hardness of heart on the other side, but giving him a little bit of this side. He's saying trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And then what? Lean not on your own understanding. Guys, things are not always going to make sense when God calls you to something. They are going to be radical they are gonna be nonsensical to most people. But if God is calling you to something and you are confident of his calling and you trust the Lord with all of your heart, you are gonna lean on his understanding and not your own. You are going to be exercising your faith muscles in a radical way that is unlike anything else that you've ever experienced in your life. When going all in, you need to stop thinking, I will go in for Christ when I have more or when I understand more or when I grow more or when things improve or when things get better. And the reality is none of that is accomplished until you decide to go all in for Jesus Christ. It's when you go all in. It's when you recalibrate. It's when you hit the reset button in life and you be, let Christ become Lord of all of it. That's when things begin to transition and when things begin to happen. But it's scary. And in a lot of ways, it's terrifying when you think about letting go and letting God. And he says this, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Not in portions, not in parts, in all, in everything. God knows what's best for you and it's everything being given over to him and allowing him to lead and control it all for you. Do you trust God in that way and in that manner? What are those things that you're white knuckling in your life right now that you won't let go to, for God to take control of? It's those things in our life that we're being told and commanded to let go of those things. And listen to what? And he will make your paths straight. He's gonna fix it. He's gonna help you along the way, but you have to trust him. You have to stop leaning on your understanding and, and trust that God knows that what he's doing and acknowledge him in every compartment of your life. Not in the Jesus parts, in all of it. So it can all be about exalting his name. So that it can all be about bringing him glory and honor. So that all the garbage, all the junk, all the struggle, all the wrestling, all of those things can be given over to God so that God begin, can begin to work in your life through you in those ways and in those moments. It takes a great reliance upon God to be able to, to go all in. But something fascinating about this passage uh, that, that I believe is, is just this idea that we are not exempt by circumstance. Think about this woman, clearly a hard life. She's been widowed, she's lost her husband, which means she has no means of provision. There's no evidence of any children here to help take care of her. So she's clearly on her own, obviously struggling to have provision. When she comes here, she's tithing a penny, if you will. And yet Jesus is saying she's put in more than anybody else. Clearly she's got nothing. And if anybody's got an excuse to go to God and say, you know what, Jesus, things are a little tough right now. Not sure I'm gonna put anything in the black box back there. You know, Jesus, I'm sorry, but I don't think that you're really doing right by me in this life. So therefore, I'm not so sure I'm gonna trust you and continue to surrender and give to you. Do you see her making any excuses to God based upon her circumstances? She gives none. All she does is give evidence of God's goodness and God's provision for her life. And she gives all that she has 
because he is all that she needs. And that's the place that we come to in life. But here's something else that's really good about this passage. Jesus doesn't give her a pass. Jesus doesn't look to her and say, you know what, darling, I understand. I didn't mean that dis disrespectfully to women, please understand, sorry. No emails, please. <laughs> Shutting it down for a day. But what he's talking about, he's saying, ma'am, I recognize and understand that life is hard. You don't need to give today, it's okay. Go on, I've got this. We'll have somebody else give today. Does he do that? No, why? Because giving is not about the amount that you give. Giving is an act of worship. Giving is giving and surrendering that what you have is not yours. And what God is wanting her to understand, she may not have much, physically in this life, but what she has and what is important to her is so much better than more money in her bank account. And what she is doing is surrendering and continuing to trust in the God who created her and made her and is protecting her, saving her, and will bring her to glorification for all eternity. Guys, Jesus is not looking at you and your circumstances in life and trying to offer you up a pass to say, you know what, I know you're busy right now, so that, therefore, you know what, you don't need to serve right now. You know what, I, I know that you've overextended yourself a little bit when it comes to debt, so you know what, you don't need to give right now for a little while. Both of those are wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that there are some times where you need to pull back. That doesn't mean that there are some times where you've got to recalibrate budgets and do some different things, but abstaining from the work of God is absolutely unbiblical. We are not called to abstain from doing what God has commanded us to do. And when you see a picture of a woman who has every excuse in the world not to participate and has a God who in compassion should look at her and say, no, don't. But in his compassion, he allows her to. But why? Because how does he use her story to help others? What does he do? When she comes to give, he doesn't ask her to abstain. He calls the disciples in to use it as a teachable moment for them to see God at work. Even in our brokenness, even in our rotten circumstances, even when we don't feel like it, but when we step forward by faith, people are watching, people will see, and it has an impact for the kingdom of God. Because what happens here, he goes to his disciples and he says, look at this woman and what she's contributing. You know, many people come in here and they write checks with big double zeros in, in, in this place. And they come and they give these big offerings and do all these things. Puff chest, oh, look at me, look how great I'm doing. And he's like, that doesn't matter. Giving out of your abundance and not giving sacrificially, that means nothing. This woman is giving far more, even though her amount is minimal. Even though we could even argue, what's she giving for, man? What are you gonna do with a penny? It's never about the amount. It's about the heart. It's about the commitment. It's about the sacrifice for the kingdom of God. And he's using this to teach these people that are here, that are watching their evidence. And he's flipping everything upside down where the Pharisees and the Sadducees would exalt those who wrote those big checks. They would lift those up and celebrate those who are wealthy in the community, providing for all the needs. But yet what Jesus is saying is, no, 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 no. You're missing the point. It's not about how much, but it's about just the giving. It's about the heart. It's about the pursuit of God. And that's not only about your checkbook, but it's about your time. Like we talked about, you're busy. I get it. We all are. But that doesn't mean you abstain from the work of God. That doesn't mean you abstain from making disciples for Christ. It doesn't mean that you don't take an opportunity to go to the marriage study in a few weeks to work on your marriage, to take that time because it's valuable. Remember, recalibrating. If things are a mess in your life, you want to fix something, fix, start with your relationship with Christ and then start with your, mar and your marriage. And then you'll see radical transformation happen in the workplace and in your relationships outside of those two areas or in all these different ways. Or you think about your finances. We've got financial peace starting tomorrow night when, with Gabe Ives and talking about teaching people how to budget, how to plan, how to be good stewards of what God's doing. It's, it's not necessarily about the how much. It's just about what you're doing with what you have whether it be time, whether it be your treasures, your talents. And how many people, you guys are sitting here and you're secretly hiding a beautiful voice or you're hiding your ability to play an instrument 
or you're hiding this incredible pr- talent to set up chairs. It's incredible. It's really awesome how that can happen. And if, you, if, if you've got that gift, I'm, we can need to talk after this. But you think about all these different things that you have a gift to do. Some are big and, and some, some can be visible, but others can be hidden. But either way, stop making excuses. God needs all of us in the game of life to be about building the kingdom of God. And so for us, we've got to, we're not exempt from circumstances of life. And just lastly, this is just real simple. Going all in is always a matter of the heart. The harder you've allowed your heart to become, the harder it is to go all in for Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible talks about needing that heart of flesh, the softening of our heart, the softening our heart to Jesus, allowing Jesus to come into our heart, into our life. This is why Jesus talked about in Matthew 6. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your treasure? What is your treasure that you're holding on to? What are you clutching in your life that you're holding on to so much that's that idol that's preventing you from going all in for Christ? That's trusting the Lord, that's putting your yes on the table for Jesus. That's willing to do the hard things, to do, do the things that are necessary to help your own life, to help your marriage, to help your relationships, to help your children, your grandchildren, to help the church, to help advance the kingdom of God. What are you doing in life? What's the treasure that's standing in the way? Because we all have them. And we're all tempted to fill our treasure box with the things that we desire and our, that we want, that we want to hold on to. But the reality is our treasure is Jesus and Jesus alone. And it is the treasure of Jesus Christ that compels us to go all in. But what we are tempted to do is we are to replace Jesus with many other things. And what Jesus is calling us to is the words of the, of, in Proverbs. He says, my son, give me your heart. Right now, give me your heart. All of you, us right now, it's a matter of surrendering your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. It's giving your life over to him, whether it be initially by faith for salvation, giving your heart over to him, a heart that apart from the work of the Holy Spirit won't even choose God. But for us today, if if we're called to give our lives over to Christ, give our hearts to Jesus, and you're feeling that prompting and that leading in your life, that is the Spirit of God awakening your soul to want to give your life to Him, to begin to follow Him in all of your ways. But what happens to many of us, maybe you were saved at a young age and you've allowed over time the enemy to steal, to kill, and destroy. He can't steal and take away your salvation, but he can certainly make life miserable along the way. And what God is saying is give me your heart and let me bring it back to that heart of flesh. Let me loosen it. Let me get the blood flowing again. Let me get you loving again. Let me get you focused on me again so you can love others well, so you can live for me, so that you can take those steps of faith and trust in life and go the extra mile to live and to love. But give me your heart. This is the first response that we must have to go all in for Christ. You think, well, I'm gonna leave here and I'm gonna, re- I'm gonna prioritize. I'm gonna make my list and here's how I'm going all in, Jesus. Just stop it because that's gonna make it worse. What you need to commit and you need to do is just to stop and to pray and say, Jesus, I'm giving you all of my heart. And guess what's gonna happen? The spirit of God is gonna awaken your soul in a way and you are gonna look at life very, very differently. You will begin to say yes to things you always said no to. You will begin to do things that you've always made you uncomfortable And believe it or not, you may find yourself in the ways of Paul where some start getting saved in and around your life because you started going all in for Jesus. And all of a sudden, that that grumpy Christian that many people encountered has now become a joyful, Christ-filled individual on mission for Christ. And your life is contagious for the lost people to see. But we have to give our hearts over to Jesus. And next, and let your eyes observe his ways. Where we stumble is we give our heart over to Jesus, but we continue to look to the world for identity. We continue to look to the world to define what is important, what is significant, and what is a priority. And what Jesus is saying, give me your heart and watch me. Follow me. I will help you to see what's important. I will help you to follow what is significant. Stop looking at the world. Stop looking at your neighbor. Stop looking at those who are successful in this life and look to me. 
we're going to recalibrate and redefine. And we're going to start with a new heart. And we're going to then go to a new purpose, which is to living out the word of God in our life. Guys, Jesus Christ has come and sacrificed his life so that you could live, so that you could be free, so that you could have an abundant life. And the abundance of life is not something that we don't get to enjoy until glorification on the other side of eternity. I truly believe that the kingdom of God is in our midst, according to the gospel of Luke, that when Christ came, he brought the kingdom of God to us to enjoy and to live. I'm not preaching prosperity gospel to you because it's gonna get hard and it's gonna get difficult. And I'm not saying that if you start giving to the little black box on your way out, that all of a sudden everything's gonna get changed in your life financially. But it, what it does is it recalibrates and refocuses you and time you begin to see the fruit of God. Guess what? Those who begin giving never regret giving. It's crazy how it works. Those who, who begin to invest time in other people for the kingdom of God, they never regret it. They begin to have stories in their life of excitement and see, see what God's doing in that person's life. Those who step out of their comfort zone to teach our kids or to lead a small group or to, to serve in the community, they never regret it. It always fills them up. They always enjoy it. But for us at the end of the day, it's about giving our heart and following Jesus. And when we do that, we go all in. So I ask you, where is your treasure lie? And if it's not in Jesus, fix it. Put it in Jesus. Give your heart to Christ. If you've pulled away, give it back. And let the Lord work in your life. No excuses. Jesus didn't give any and neither should we. And I can promise you this, with no excuses and a heart for Jesus, the gates of hell are gonna quake through this church. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. And God, we thank you for your word and your truth. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you. God, we are thankful that 2,000 years ago, almost, there was a poor widow who had nothing. And she took the time with every excuse in the world not to, to step forward by faith and to give all that she had for you. And God, I praise you for that poor widow. I praise you for the example that she set for me personally. And I praise you that we can still talk about it today through the reading of your word, that she's still impacting lives thousands of years later. May we think about our own life as it relates to the widow. Father God, we are called to rely upon you more and more. May you build and grow our faith leaving here today to give all of us ourselves over to you. God, may we stop making excuses and may we go all in with our heart. And God, through that journey of going all in for you, I pray that salvations are one. I pray that people come to faith in Jesus Christ as we faithfully serve you. God, I pray that you begin to transform lives, radically change budgets, radically change schedules and times and relationships so that when we go all in, we see the fruit that comes, the assurance of the promises that you give that when we trust in you with all of our heart, we lean not on our own understanding, but we acknowledge you in all of our ways and that, Father, we can see the straightening of our paths, the stressfulness of life. God, may you take that. The hecticness of life, may you take it. May we recalibrate today, have a new focus today for salvations tomorrow. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.